Hello, and welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. It's entitled, Charged Aerosol Detection Applications in Biopharmaceutical Analysis. When carrying out biopharmaceutical HPLC analysis, researchers traditionally have relied on ultraviolet visible spectroscopy or ultraviolet visible spectrophotometry. However, there, there are limitations to this approach, as for example in the case where the bioproduct is formulated in UV transparent excipients. As a result, charged aerosol detection has gained in popularity. Why? Well, that's going to be the main topic during today's webinar. I am John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of GEN, and I'm going to serve as the moderator. Our presenters are both from Bo Fisher Scientific. Dr. Dave Thomas is Product and Support Scientist, and Dr. Bruce Bailey serves as Product Applications Manager. They're going to illustrate and describe several examples where charged aerosol detection can be used from drug discovery to quality control. They will also show how the technique can be used to detect and quantify substances separated by reversed phase and hydrophilic interaction chromatography. After the panelists have made their presentations, there will be a question and answer segment. Feel free to send in a question for our panelists at any time during the webinar. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the left side of your console and then submit. The panel will try to answer as many as possible. Dr. Thomas will be our first presenter. So Dave, the floor is all yours. Good morning and thank you, Mr. Sterling. And good morning, Dr. Bailey and all of you joining today's webinar. This is Dave Thomas from the Thermos Fisher Scientific CMD Group in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. I'm going to begin today's webinar by discussing a unique HPLC detector that is being used in biopharmaceutical labs all over the world to quantify active biopharmaceutical entities, formulation components, intermediates, impurities, and degradation products. I'll focus on the benefits and on the fundamentals of charged aerosol detection. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Bruce Bailey, who will discuss recent applications of charged aerosol detection in biopharmaceutical analysis. Our goal is that through this webinar, you will learn the key benefits of charged aerosol detection, understand how charged aerosol detection works and how it compares to other HPLC detection techniques, and see selected applications of HPLC CAD in biopharmaceutical analysis and how HPLC CAD can complement your analytical workflows. So the webinar is divided into sections that introduce charged aerosol detection, explain the basic principles of operation, and showcase some current applications of HPLC CAD in biopharmaceutical analysis. Let's begin by introducing the charged aerosol detector, or CAD, and looking at why and how it is being used in the biopharma industry. We start by asking the question, why use charged aerosol detection at all? After all, HPLC with UV vis detection is simple, sensitive, and robust. It has served as the workhorse for pharma and biopharma ap applications for many years. But as you all know, no single HPLC detector is ideal. All detectors respond more strongly to some analytes than they do to others. Sometimes one wants a very selective detector, such as a fluorescence or electrochemical detector. At other times, one may want a less selective, more universal detector. Charged aerosol detection is often the best choice in the latter case. Charged aerosol detection is a mass-sensitive technique that quantifies any non-volatile and most semi-volatile analytes after separation by liquid chromatography. This technique provides consistent analyte response independent of chemical characteristics. That is, an analyte's response does not depend on optical properties, such as absorbance or fluorescence, or the ability to ionize, as with mass spectrometry. We can demonstrate this by comparing three different types of detectors used with the same sample and chromatographic method. We inject a mixture containing equal masses of three drugs and a counter ion onto the acclaimed Trinity P1, a mixed mode column combining ion exchange and reversed phase characteristics. Looking at each chromatogram from the top and moving down, we see that each detector shows a variable response for each of the compounds. 
chloride is not detected at all by UV or MS under these conditions. UV shows poor response for verapamil, while MS detection shows poor response to ketoprofen. Only the charged aerosol detector shows good response for each compound, and the responses are more uniform than with the other detectors. The same behavior holds true for any non-volatile analyte. The response of the charged aerosol detector is proportional to the mass injected, typically from low nanogram to mid nanogram amounts. So why would you use the charged aerosol detector? You would use it if you want to detect every non-volatile analyte. If you value uniform response, when you require sensitive and precise quantitation, if you desire ease of use, and if you want to develop analyses that use a single method for quantitation by HPLC-CAD and characterization by LCMS. These attributes explain why charged aerosol detection is proven to be the most rapidly adopted and fastest growing universal de detector on the market. Here's another example to underscore the point that the charged aerosol detector is able to detect many compounds that would be invisible to a UV detector alone. The chromatogram shows an HPLC separation of nine compounds with detection by UV in line with CAD. The CAD in the bottom trace sees leucine, phenylalanine, erythromycin, and dodecyl sulfate that might be completely missed by low wavelength UV detection. The CAD not only quantifies more analytes than a UV detector can, but its response to all analytes is more uniform. The CAD's uniform response has been demonstrated with numerous analytes from small molecules to proteins. The bar chart that you see here compares the response of the detector to 24 analytes that vary widely in chemical structure and molecular weight. Despite these wide differences, the peak area response of the charged aerosol detector varies by less than 11% RSD because the CAD is responding to the mass of analyte injected and not to its properties. Note that this experiment was performed by flow injection analysis in order to compare detector response independently of other factors. Finally, note the threshold between non-volatile and volatile analytes. Analytes with vapor pressure greater than about 10 to the minus third tor are generally too volatile for charged aerosol detection, but you would probably want to analyze these by gas chromatography anyway. Charged aerosol detection provides sensitive quantitative measurement of many compounds, including proteins, lipids, surfactants, simple sugars, complex oligosaccharides, underivitized amino acids, inorganic and organic ions, polymers, and amines. Dr. Bailey will provide example applications for many of these analytes in the second half of today's webinar. We're going to take a closer look at the technology behind charged aerosol detection, which has been evolving for about 10 years now. Charged aerosol detection for HPLC was realized commercially with the advent of the Corona CAD in 2005. Ten years of continuous improvement have led to today's CAD detectors that are more sensitive, versatile, and easier to use than the first model. The latest additions to the CAD lineup are the Corona Veo and the Vanquish charged aerosol detector. These newest detectors incorporate many design and performance improvements, including a radically new focus jet concentric nebulization system that improves sensitivity and precision by providing more consistent formation of aerosol particles. This technology was leveraged from our mass spectrometry portfolio. Also, an all-new evaporation scheme that widens the scope of applications to include standard HPLC, UHPLC, and low flow for micro LC. The ability to optimize the evaporation temp also expands the choice of mobile phase constituents. Overall, usability and serviceability are enhanced by numerous improvements, many of which came as recommendations from our customers. Now let's dive into the internal workings of the charged aerosol detector. At the top middle of this diagram, indicated by the number one, you can see the liquid mobile phase 
from the LC column entering the detector, where it is nebulized by, by combining with a concentric stream of nitrogen gas. The aerosol droplets are sorted in the spray chamber, denoted by number three. The finer droplets are carried by bulk gas flow to the evaporation or drying tube, where desolvation occurs to form dry particles from any non-volatile or semi-volatile species. Any remaining large droplets drain away to waste. The dry analyte particles exit from evaporation and combine in the mixing chamber, denoted by number seven, with a second gas stream that has been charged by a high voltage corona charger. The charged gas mixes with the dry particles and transfers positive charge to the analyte particle surface. Please note that with CAD, the charge remains on the surface of the dried analyte particles, while the analytes themselves remain intact and are not ionized. After passing through an ion trap, number eight, that removes any high mobility species, the remaining charged particles pass to a collector and are measured by a sensitive electrometer. The amount of charge is proportional to the area of the analyte particle, and the area of the analyte particle is proportional to the mass of analyte injected. So the total charge found over the course of a peak is directly proportional to the mass of the separated analyte. The re resulting signal is output to the chromatography data system, and the bottom line is that the signal produced is directly pro proportional to the quantity of analyte. Now let's draw some comparisons between the CAD and a competing nebulization-based detector. And one way to compare detectors is to examine their overall response curve. In the case of ELSD, which is the other detector that we're comparing to, uh, we see that it uses scattered light to detect analyte particles. Because of this, the detection process involves changes between three different light scattering domains as particle size changes. This makes ELSD response curves quite complex and often sigmoidal, as shown in the top left panel. A major consequence of ELSD sigmoidal response is that the dynamic range is small and analyte signal rapidly decreases and completely disappears as the amount of analyte decreases. The charged aerosol detector is also nonlinear and exhibits a parabolic response curve. Unlike ELSD, CAD response does not simply disappear at the low end of analyte amount. Therefore, charged aerosol detection is generally more sensitive and provides a wider dynamic range than ELSD. For quantitation, the charged aerosol detector is approximately linear over a short range. So often it's convenient to use a linear calibration curve over a limited range of interest. Over the entire dynamic range, CAD response, as I said, is typically parabolic. To calibrate over a wide dynamic range, for example, if you are doing impurity analysis, a quadratic equation is typically used. The most appropriate calibration type will depend upon the method and data objectives, but the good news, at all are, good news is that all are easily selected uh, with any modern CDS system. Now, the shape of the response curves determine several important figures of merit for these detectors, including quantitative accuracy, response uniformity, and sensitivity. Let's take a moment to look, at, uh, look into each one of these in turn. We begin with an experiment comparing the quantitative accuracy of CAD and ELSD. Takahashi and coworkers analyzed a certified reference material of polyethylene glycol, or PEG, by size exclusion chromatography with detection by either ELSD or CAD. First, the size distribution of the PEG was accurately determined by NMR. These certified values are indicated by the black plus signs in this chart of peak area fraction versus degree of polymerization, or DP. The higher the DP, the larger the PEG molecule. The quantity of PEG of each DP, as determined by CAD, shown by the blue circles, was nearly identical to the NMR certified value whereas the quantity obtained by the ELSD detector, shown by the red triangles, shows significant error. The reason behind the error in the ELSD measurement is worth looking into. 
It goes back to ELSD's sigmoidal calibration curve. This causes ELSD to underestimate the amount at low concentrations and overestimate the amount at high concentrations. The net result for chromatography is an artificial, uh, artificial sharpening of the HPLC peak. The peaks appear sharp, so one might misinterpret this as showing high efficiency and good resolution. The problem is that the nice sharp peak shape is gained at the expense of accuracy. As you can see in the above comparison, the ELSD detector clearly overestimated the amounts of PEG eluding in the midpoint of the DP distribution, and it underestimated the amount at the low and high ends. One of the chief benefits of a universal detector is being able to use it to estimate the quantity of unknowns, such as reaction intermediates, impurities, or degradation products, when no pure reference standard is available. Recall that on slide eight, we showed the uniform response of the charged aerosol detector for a suite of 24 compounds analyzed by flow injection. So let's compare the response uniformity of CAD against ELSD. To make the comparison, we analyzed a mixture of seven drugs containing equal amounts by mass of each drug by using gradient refer reverse phase HPLC. Even though CAD response is independent of chemical structure or properties, for both CAD and ELSD, there is a solvent effect that operates indirectly during the nebulization of the HPLC mobile phase. We offer a simple solution termed the inverse gradient approach that, minimi that minimizes that effect and allows us to directly compare the response of the two detectors to each analyte. As you can see in the chromatograms in the left panel, the analyte peak heights by CAD appear more uniform than by ELSD. This difference is quantified in the bar chart on the left, rather on the right, I'm sorry, which tallies the deviations of the peak areas from their average. The charged aerosol detector clearly shows a more uniform response because the analyte's physiochemical properties affect the CAD much less than ELSD. This makes the CAD detector more useful for estimating the amount of impurities or degradants when no standards are available. Finally, let's compare the sensitivity of CAD and ELSD. First, please note that when using aerosol-based detectors, one must be very careful to avoid extrapolation from nonlinear data. Unfortunately, an all too common mistake made by ELSD proponents is to exaggerate the limits of detection obtainable by ELSD detectors by doing exactly this. This is done by measuring the signal to noise obtained from a relatively high concentration of analyte and then extrapolating downward to estimate limits of detection. But remember that because of ELSD's sigmoidal response curve, the response generally falls off precipitously at the low concentration end of the curve. These chromatograms of a mixture of compounds illustrate the pitfalls of using downward extrapolation from the signal-to-noise ratios of a mid-level calibration standard to estimate LODs. On the left panel, the average signal-to-noise ratio of the ELSD at 1283 is higher than the charged aerosol detector at 230 for a medium level standard. So if you took this data and extrapolated to signal to noise equals three to estimate detection limits, it would seem that the ELSD is more sensitive when compared to the charged aerosol detector. But if you look to the chromatograms on the right panel, they clearly illustrate that the charged aerosol detector has much better sensitivity compared to the ELSD when actual low-level standards are analyzed. Limits of detection should always be determined from replicate injections of low-level standards. When the correct procedure is followed, CAD is generally shown to be more sensitive than ELSD. So let's summarize some of the performance differences between the charged aerosol and ELSD detectors. Most important on this table, the signal response of the ELSD, as we said, is sigmoidal. And as we just saw, this adversely affects quantitative accuracy, uniformity of response, and sensitivity. The charged aerosol detector exhibits a parabolic signal response that does not sharply fall off at the low end, as happens with the LSD. 
This gives the charged aerosol detector good sensitivity at one nanogram or below and a dynamic range exceeding three orders of magnitude. Now that we know why and how CAT is being used, let's take a moment to introduce its role in bio biopharmaceutical workflows before we turn it over to Bruce for the application. Universal detectors, such as the charged aerosol detector, provide unique solutions to many of the challenges faced in bringing safe and effective drugs to market. From discovery to manufacturing and product release, CAD detectors are helping to answer questions about the character, purity, strength, quality, and stability of biotherapeutics and excipients. Because of its uniform response, the charged aerosol detector allows simplified workflows for many HPLC-based analyses by eliminating the need for multiple detectors, by simplifying sample preparation, by eliminating the need for labeling reactions, and by allowing good estimates of the amount of impurities and degradation products when no standard is available. Dr. Bruce Bailey will cover several of these areas in his portion of today's web webinar, but he won't have time to cover all of them. So you can visit the Thermo Scientific website and our Apps Lab library to see more examples of HPLC CAD solutions, applications, and e-workflows for biopharmaceutical analysis. So let's summarize what we have seen in uh, the first portion of today's webinar. First, charged aerosol detection delivers accurate and precise quantification of lipids, carbohydrates, surfactants, amines, and counterions that UV visabsorbents cannot detect. Second, for analytes with chromophores, charged aerosol detection provides a uniform response independent of extinction coefficient at a particular wavelength. Third, charged aerosol detection provides a good estimate of the amount of unknown impurities and degradation products even when a pure standard is not available. And finally, charged aerosol detection is typically superior to ELSD in terms of sensitivity, dynamic range, and response uniformity. Well, thank you all for your attention, and now we'll proceed to part two of today's webinar with Dr. Bruce Bailey. And now back to you, Mr. Sterling. Thank you, Dave, for showing us how charged aerosol detection works and describing the benefits of using this technology. And I'm really sure your slide illustrating the broad range of critical biopharma applications of HPLC CAD was of particular interest to our audience. And as you pointed out, uh, Bruce is going to pick up with that. So thank you so much. Just a reminder that there will be a question and answer segment after the last presentation. Please type your question into the box on the left-hand side of your console and then hit submit. Our next speaker is Dr. Bruce Bailey, and Bruce, it is all yours. Good morning. I would like to thank Dr. Thomas for his presentation. Today, I will be presenting various applications in biopharmaceutical analysis using charged aerosol detection. The topics that I intend to discuss include various biopharmaceutical applications such as the analysis of glycans, vaccine adjuvants, antibiotics, counterions, and many excipients used in the formulation of protein therapeutics. The main theme is that many of these compounds lack a suitable chromophore structure for detection by diode array, therefore we use charged aerosol detection. Glycoproteins are proteins decorated with carbohydrates. The term glycan refers to the monosaccharides, oligosaccharides, or polysaccharides that commonly modify proteins called glycoprotein or proteoglycans, or lipids, which are termed glycolipids. These glycans play a major role in proper protein function. Glycans typically are comprised of about 10 monosaccharide residues linked in branched or unbranched chains. Changes in the number, type, composition, or linkage pattern of these glycans may influence the efficacy of a biotherapeutic product or serve as a biomarker of disease. 
it is very important to be able to correctly identify and measure these glycan patterns. Now, the cell is able to facilitate glycan diversity because almost every aspect of glycosylation can be modified, including glycosidic linkage, the site of glycan binding, for example, N-linked or O-linked glycans, glycan composition, the types of sugars that are linked to a particular protein, glycan structure, branched or unbranched chains, and glycan length, short or long chain oligosaccharides. Glycosylation is the most common post-translational modification present on biopharmaceuticals. Today, the majority of protein drug candidates in development are glycosylated. Now, glycosylation of therapeutic proteins influences immunogenicity, biological activity, stability, and pharmacokinetics. Regulatory agencies now require producers of therapeutic glycoproteins to demonstrate that glycosylation is consistent via detailed structural analysis. Because glycans are polar molecules, they are only weakly retained on reverse phase HPLC columns. So they are typically separated on columns using porous graphitic carbon, helic, anion exchange, or mixed mode. Because they have no chromophore, glycans are detected directly by pulse amperometry or mass spectrometry or by fluorescence after labeling with 2AA or 2AB. Nearly every combination of separation and detection mode has been demonstrated, but the most common combinations for separation and detection of glycans are helic with fluorescence and high-performance anion exchange chromatography with pulse amper amperometric detection for quantitation and helic MS and mixed mode MS for identification and characterization. Thermal Scientific has prepared many different applications, webinars, and guides related to the analysis of glycoproteins using HPAE pad and HPLC with fluorescence or MS detection. Today, however, I would like to focus on some of the newer applications using HPLC with charged aerosol detection for the direct determination of glycans from glycoproteins. Here we see a very simple, label-free, and direct method for quantitative glycan profiling of the N-linked glycans are released from proteins by the enzyme PNGase F, and the native glycans are then separated by UHPLC on the glycan pack AXR1 column. This column employs both weak anion exchange and reverse phase separation mechanisms to resolve glycans based on charge, isomeric structure, and size. The native end glycans are then detected directly without derivatization by using charged aerosol detection. This simplified workflow for the HPLC CAD eliminates the time and expense of labeling, which can be quite beneficial. Here we see a similar application, but this time for O-link glycans. O-link means that the glycans are linked to the amino acid serine or threonine on the protein. Unlike N-link glycans, there is no simple enzyme available to release O-glycans in a form readily um, to be labeled for detection by HPLC with fluorescence detection. One common way to release O-glycans is through a chemical reaction called beta-reductive elimination. 
This slide shows two examples of direct injection after minimal sample prep of glycoprotein digest prepared by typical workflows. The top trace is the HPLC CAD chromatogram of the O-link glycan pool released from mucin. Mucin O-link glycation has been associated with colorectal and breast cancers. The bottom trace shows the O-link glycan pool released from fetuin, a protein commonly used for method development or qualification. Separations are performed on the glycan pack AXH1 column, which can separate glycans based on charge, size, and polarity. Glycans are then detected directly using the Vanquish charged aerosol detector. Glycoprotein product characterizations can be performed using mobile phases which are compatible with nebulizer-based detectors. Thus, the Corona CAD and MS can be used orthogonally with the Corona CAD providing glycan profiles and quantitative data, while MS provides important structural information. The combined technique is a powerful approach to glycan identification and quantification. In this example, the analysis of glycans from fetuin using both charged aerosol and MS detection techniques is shown. Most of the sample is diverted to the CAD for quantitative data, while the MS provides important structural information. For glycoprotein analysis, detection by the Corona CAD provides a simpler workflow and avoid some of the pitfalls of pulse amperometric detection, which uses high salt, and fluorescence detection, where O-glycan peeling, fluorescent impurities, and ion pairing agents can interfere with the subsequent analysis. Since the CAD and MS offer similar data patterns, the use of the simpler CAD detector in a QC environment is possible. The following chromatogram illustrates the characterization of vaccine adjuvants using a fast and sensitive HPLC method to measure the strength and purity of vaccine adjuvant formulations. Vaccine adjuvants help promote the effectiveness of a vaccine by reducing the amount or frequency of the required dose, by prolonging the duration of immunological memory, or by modulating the involvement of humoral or cellular responses. Potential adjuvants represent a very diverse group of substances whose chemical structures and mechanisms of action vary quite widely. Complicating such analyses, many adjuvants under investigation contain components that are not readily analyzed by traditional HPLC with UV detection. These include various mixtures of lipids, fatty acids, and glycosides that lack suitable UV chromophores. Here, the lack of a detectable chromophore in DPPC and its degradation product, lysophosphatidylcholine, proves to be no problem for the charged aerosol detector. The absence of pronounced mobile phase gradient effect is also beneficial in integrating the smaller peaks, enabling more accurate quanti quantitation. This application illustrates how charged aerosol detection is being used to evaluate drug composition. Gentamicin is an antibiotic manufactured by bacterial fermentation. The drug formulation of gentamicin sulfate is a mixture of four major compounds, gentamicin C1, C1A, C2, and C2A, and a minor component, gentamicin C2B. All of these compounds are structurally similar and do not possess a strong chromophore, thus making HPLC-UV of little use. In addition, 
there might be fermentation or related impurities and degradation products in the final um, formulation. The chromatogram shown in the top panel illustrates the analysis of gentamicin sulfate by HPLC-CAT. The separation was performed using the pol a claim polar advantage two column under low pH conditions that would degrade conventional C8 or C18 columns. Because of the wide range of pH stability, the P82 column is ideal for the analysis of polar and nonpolar analytes in the same run. HPLC-CAT is sensitive enough to measure all of the main congeners as well as the minor component gentamicin C2B. Note also how little the CAD trace is affected by gradient of the mobile phase containing both TFA and heptafluorobutyric acid. This really helps when integrating the smaller peaks. In the lower panel, a hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography method was optimized for the analysis of apromycin sulfate and its impurities. In order to, to detect all of the trace impurities of apromycin, sulfate should be eliminated. Therefore, to remove sulfate, an anion exchange solid phase extraction cartridge was employed. The overall results demonstrate that helic CAD can be used as a good alternative to um, strong cation exchange UV in the separation of apromycin, especially in the analysis of minor apromycin-related um, compounds. More than 50% of all pharmaceutical active ingredients, APIs, are administered as salts. Measuring the quantity of counterions and residual salts is critical for determining the purity, mass balance, and the stoichiometry of drug formulations. There are excellent methods for measuring counterions, such as dionics ion chromatography that use instruments perfected for and dedicated to ion analysis. However, for users that want to make use of existing HPLC equipment, this HPLC approach offers a very flexible alternative. Here an application was developed to analyze 25 common anionic and cationic drug counter ions with charged aerosol detection. Especially noteworthy is the simultaneous analysis of inorganic and organic anions and cations in the same, at the same time on the same instrument. Now the acclaimed Trinity P1 column used in this application is a special mixed mode column capable of separation based on reverse phase anionic and cationic mechanisms. This unique chemistry ensures spatial separation of the anion exchange and cation exchange regions. Here are two quick examples that show simultaneous API and counter ion analysis. The top trace illustrates an acidic API, penicillin G, and its counter cation, potassium. The bottom chromatogram illustrates an, a basic API, metformin, and its counter anion, chloride. There's really no other approach to API and counter ion analysis that comes close to this for simplicity and speed. Unwanted aggregation is a major degradation pathway of protein therapeutics during their storage. Stabilization of these protein formulations can be enhanced through the addition of specific excipients such as counter ions, surfactants, polymers, amino acids, and sugars. The following segment of slides is related to the analysis of these excipients 
using various HPLC methods with charged aerosol detection. Besides the API counter ions and impurities, many drug formulations include excipients to impart all sorts of desired qualities. The applications group in Chelmsford developed several fast, simple, and quantitative methods for surfactant excipient analysis. These excipients must be characterized as incoming raw materials, after formulation, and instability studies. In addition to the two examples shown here for Triton X100 and Tween 80, similar assays for Tween 20, Pleuronic F127, and several other surfactants can be viewed on the Thermal Scientific Apps Lab Library. Triton X100, shown on the top panel, is a non-ionic surfactant that is very commonly used as a detergent to lyse cell walls when extracting proteins or organelles and to enhance membrane permeability of living cells. Polysorbate 80, also known as tween 80, shown in the bottom panel, is a non-ionic surfactant and emulsifier der derived from polyethoxylated sorbitan and oleic acid. Now, tween 80 is used in many vaccines and biotherapeutic formulations as an excipient to help stabilize aqueous formulations or as an emulsifier to help solubilize hydrophobic components. Other methods for fast quantitation of tween 80 typically hydrolyze tween with base and then analyze the oleic acid residues by reverse phase HPLC with UV detection. Compared to these methods, HPLC CAD is much simpler, more direct, and requires less sample prep. Pleuronic F127, or Paloxamir 407, is a non-ionic polyol surfactant. Due to the variety of different structures contained within this complex product, a characterization method was developed using a solid core C18 column and charged aerosol detection. This helps determine the relative amounts of these different components, which may vary from lot to lot. Another example shows the complete characterization a polysorbate 80 within 34 minutes, providing a chromatogram containing different subsets of this complex analyte. The ability to see product variations and monitor surfactant variability may help understand its impact on end product quality. In this example, peak areas are integrated by retention time windows when and when subtracted from the areas obtained from reference material, this helps determine the possible differences that may exist. The sum of these absolute differences can then be used to determine important, actionable decisions concerning product quality so that unacceptable products are not used in final production. Sometimes, one doesn't need a fast quantitative method, but instead needs a profiling method with high resolution to furnish more detailed information. This can be useful for profiling the complex distribution of polymers that help shape the physical and chemical properties of the excipient. Examples of qualitative analysis of the excipient polyethylene glycol, or PEG, are shown in this series of chromatograms. Lower molecular weight pegs are often used as solvents in oral liquids and soft capsules, whereas solid variants are used as ointment bases, tablet binders, and film coatings. These HPLC CAD chromatograms show the profile of four different pegs 
with different molecular weight distributions. This fast and high resolution separation is made possible by the acclaimed surfactant plus column, which uses mixed mode chromatography technology and advanced surface chemistry to provide both reverse phase and anion exchange retention mechanisms. The column chemistry is designed in such a way that it elutes in the order of cationic, non-ionic, amphoteric, and anionic surfactants. Ternary gradient conditions are used to produce sharper polysorbate peaks that are present in this formulation. A gradient method was developed for the simultaneous analysis of tween 80 and protein component in a mock formulation using HPLC UV CAD on an AccuCore 150C4 column. Similar formulation examples were successfully quantitated when either insulin or BSA proteins were added to different samples. Automated chromatographic separation of therapeutic protein and amino acid excipients can be performed using a 2D approach. Proteins are separated using a C4 column followed by a diode array detector. A heart cut containing polar amino acids is trapped into a sample loop and then transferred to a second column via switching valve. The separation of underivitized amino acid excipients is then achieved within 15, 18 minutes using reverse phase column with ion pairing and charged aerosol detection. The separation of the protein BSA is shown in this example in this chromatogram using the thermal scientific AccuCore 150C4 column with a gradient of water acetyl nitrile and each solvent containing TFA as an ion pairing agent. The same analytical conditions can also be used for the analysis of therapeutics comprised of monoclonal antibodies. A hard cut ranging from 0.5 to 0.8 minutes contains any polar amino acids from the formulation which is then transferred to a second column via the switching valve. Amino acids present in protein formulations serve as buffers, bulking agents, stabilizers, and antioxidants. Eight specific amino acids are commonly used as excipients in protein form therapeutic formulations due to their physicochemical properties. These include arginine, aspartate, glutamate, lysine, proline, glycine, histidine, and methionine, as shown in the blue upper trace. Amino acids such as lysine and arginine are positively charged, while glutamate and aspartate have a net negative charge. For example, glutamic acid and histidine can help adjust the final pH of the formulation and replace organic buffers such as acetate and citrate, respectively. Methionine can be included as an antioxidant in formulations, and arginine has been shown to be highly effective at suppressing aggregation in both liquid and lyophilized formulations, while glycine, proline, serine, and alanine can partially serve in this capacity as well. Now, the acclaimed PA2 UHPLC column used in this application provides excellent separation characteristics for these unlabeled amino acids. Gradient conditions are adjusted by selecting appropriate ion pairing reagents, pH, and level of organic solvents. The system used for simultaneous protein and carbohydrate analysis uses a reverse phase column for protein separations and a helix column for the separation of carbohydrates. 
integrating the two disparate chemistries requires careful consideration of sample transfer between these two different columns. In this case, a heart cut from the first column is transferred to a sample holding loop. This transfer is accompanied by the infusion of acetonitrile into the flow stream to effectively dilute the aqueous aliquot with a more appropriate solvent condition required for helix separation of carbohydrates. The six major sugars used as excipients in protein therapeutics are shown in this example. Use of the Shodex VG50 column provides its advantages over other amino columns, especially with reducing sugars such as lactose and maltose. Calibration curves are similar for all sugars, with minor differences observed for the two sugar alcohols used in this evaluation. Also noteworthy is that acceptable recovery values were achieved for all six carbohydrates shown in this example. One interesting aspect identified during protein analysis is that the charged aerosol detector outperforms the UV detector at 280 nanometers as far as signal to noise ratio is concerned. In this example, the limit of detection for BSA was five times lower using the charged aerosol detector. So let's summarize what we've seen in today's webinar. First, charged aerosol detection delivers accurate and precise quantitation of lipids, carbohydrates, surfactants, amines, and counterines that UV vis absorbents cannot detect. Second, for analytes with chromophores, charged aerosol detection provides more uniform response independent of extinction coefficient at a particular wavelength. Third, charged aerosol detection provides a good estimate of the amount of unknown impurities and degradation products, even if reference material is unavailable. And finally, charged aerosol detection is typically superior to ELSD in terms of sensitivity, dynamic range, response uniformity, precision, and ease of use. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar. For the next five or ten minutes, we will welcome you to ask any questions that you might have about charged aerosol detection and remain listening as we do our best to answer as many questions as time per permits. I will now turn you over to our moderator. Thank you, Bruce, and thanks again to Dave Thomas for those very timely presentations on charged aerosol detection. Uh, it really looks like you struck a chord with our audience as we received some very interesting questions. So why don't we take the first one? Okay, we're now going to take got some questions from the audience. So, Bruce, the first one is for you. You mentioned AD is more sensitive than ELSD. Is that an absolute statement, or is the sensitivity gain or loss sample dependent? Yeah, many of the literature examples where authors have compared ELSD versus CAD, um, they've demonstrated um, over and over again that the CAT is about tenfold more sensitive than ELSD. In our own research at Thermo Fisher, we've also been able to see that. Um, I haven't seen any examples at this point where um, that has not held true. And Bruce, what's a typical injection volume for this detector? Yeah, actually, the injection volume used for a specific application is often dependent on the column um, rather than the detector. Um, 
for example, many of the UHPLC columns, injection volumes will range from 0.5 to 10 microliters, um, and that's, that's really typical. However, applications that may use a trap column for sample concentration um, can use much higher injection volume, um, anywhere from 50 to 100 microliters. Thank you. And Bruce, is CAD compatible with one, non volatile buffers, two, with ion pairing agents, and in gradient dilution? Yeah, actually, all the buffers used with the charged aerosol detector need to be volatile. Um, and that holds true even for the ion pairing agent. Um, in one of the examples, we actu actually used uh, nonofluoropentanoic acid as an ion pairing agent, which is one of the larger um, perfluorinated carboxylic acids. And as long as it's volatile, it can be used uh, quite easily with the charged aerosol detector. Um, the main um, symptom, if something is not volatile um, and is interfering with detector operation, will be that the background current will elevate. Now, some volatile buffers, such as ammonium bicarbonate, they require a little more optimization be adjusting the evaporation temperature of the veil. Um, and then we just really need to remember that any buffers that are not volatile should be avoided because the detector background current will be elevated to an unusable level. And that holds true with any nebulizer-based detector. And Bruce, do all the chromatograms you presented employ an inverse gradient? Actually, none of the chromatograms that I uh, um, illustrated in my section use the inverse gradient at all. Um, there was one very early on where we compared UV versus charged aerosol where an inverse gradient was used, but that was the only example. Thank you. And what else, Bruce, what LC buffers are recommended and which ones are discouraged? Um, I think I've already answered that, but I'll, I'll try to exemplify that one more time. All buffers used with the charged aerosol detector need to be volatile. So the ammonium acetates, ammonium formates, um, um, acetic acid, TFA, those are all volatile and can be used. Um, some buffers, such as ammonium bicarbonate, require further optimization um, by simply adjusting the evaporation temperature. Probably um, the biggest issue is if a column has a, a history with a non-volatile buffer, such as phosphate, the background currents would be elevated, but that would quickly wash out, and then um, the volatile buffer would be used. So the ones, the buffers that we discourage from using are those that, you know, are non-volatile. And Bruce, what flow rate can the instruments handle? Actually, um, the Bayo SD can use flow rates uh, ranging anywhere from 0.2 to 2 mils a minute while the VAO RS, due to advanced electronic flow control, can actually be used at flow rates from 0 0.01 mil per minute up to two mils per minute. And you just have to select um, whether you're using, um, you know, micro mode versus analytical mode. And thank you, Bruce. And Dave, we have some questions for you. Is it guaranteed that the analyte will form the same size and shape every time uh, because surface area and therefore a massive particle can change with different structures? Yeah, so I would say, strictly speaking, no, we, we cannot guarantee that. However, um, in, in practice, to a first approximation, uh, the particle that's being analyzed is approximately spherical in shape. And 
remember that analyte particle is composed of many, probably millions or billions of particles. So I think the question arises because it's, it is true if you have a polymer, say a protein, um, some of them are globular, some of them are have more of a linear shape. Um, and I think that the caller probably was um, making the, the question was based on that. But once these clump together in a particle, there are so many of them that uh, no matter the, the size or shape of the individual analyte molecule, the particles themselves are approximately uh, spherical. And that's why the response for each analyte that's been separated by an HPLC is, is uh, pretty uniform. And Dave, why would GC be better than CAT for the analytes you mentioned? Yeah, so I didn't, I, ac I actually didn't really make that statement, but the, the point I was making is this, that the uh, charged aerosol detector detects non-volatile analytes. And what we really mean by that is an analyte that is less volatile than the mobile phase. So for example, we don't want to detect acetonitrile or methanol uh, or water or ammonium formate. Those are part of the buffer and they are volatile and are not detected. Um, so if you have an analyte that is more volatile than acetonitrile, say, uh, it's gonna, you're not gonna see that. Uh, it's gonna be removed along with the mobile phase. In that case, for that type of molecule, you'd probably, you, you know, it's probably gonna be um, in the gas phase and you'd probably wanna analyze it by GC. That's the point that we were making. Thank you. Okay, that's clear. And someone referring to slide, Ted, could wavelengths lower than 24 nm improve the UV detection for these analytes? Sure. I mean, in, in general, you either a lower wavelength or in some cases a higher wavelength that uh, corresponds to the absorption maximum of the analyte would give, um, would give, uh, could give better detection limits. Um, really, the point of this slide is to illustrate what, um, you know, a typical detectors operated in sort of a universal mode would detect. And I, I believe on that slide we actually show a different wavelength than 254. So um, if the caller wants to look at those slides, we can, I think that they are accessible on the website and they can go back and look at two different UV wavelengths shown there. But in general, yes, you could fine tune the UV wavelength if you knew the best wavelength for a given molecule. And Dave, uh, could SIM for each of the four compounds uh, mentioned on slide eight improve the MS detection? Yep, and so really this is very similar to the last question, and the answer is yes. If you knew which SIM mass to charge to choose for an analyte, then you could obviously um, increase signal to noise for that analyte. But again, the, the point that we were making is that if you're operating the detectors in sort of a universal mode, um, then, you know, from mass spec, you'd probably be looking at the total ion chromatogram. And um, if, you, if you don't know, like if you're looking at impurities or if you're looking at a, um, looking for degradation products or unknowns in general, you're not going to know which sim to look for, and so that's why we didn't use that as an example. And I'm sure a question a lot of people like to know, how do I optimize a CAD method? Okay, so uh, this is really pretty simple. Um, and before I give a description, I would just point the caller to our technical note 157, which provides guidelines. This can be you know, obtained on the Thermo Scientific website. But in general, the first step is that you would, you would optimize your separation. So you would choose the column and the mobile phases and the buffer that, um, and the conditions that gave you the best separation, remembering, of course, that you have to use uh, a, a volatile buffer system and that you want to use very high purity water and solvents. So we recommend LCMS grade solvents. Once you've optimized the separation, then to optimize the detector, it's really pretty simple. Um, probably the first thing that you would do is inject low-level standards and 
uh, look at the signal to noise of your analytes as you varied the evaporation tube temperature. So you might look at, depending on which detector you had, you might look at three different um, temperatures, say 35, 50, and 80 degrees centigrade. And you would just look at your low level analytes and see which temperature optimized the signal to noise. Um, at that point, you're really almost finished. Um, the only other thing that you might do is then go back and look at calibration over the range of interest. Are you interested in a very narrow calibration range or are you interested in a wider calibration range? And you, you might, uh, as, as a second order optimization, look at the effect of evaporation temperature on the, um, the calibration curve. And you might also, at that point, decide to explore using different power functions, which we didn't go into here, but it's a very simple way of um, optimizing the calibration linearity for those who want to do that. So basically, you, se you optimize your separation, and then you would look at uh, evaporation temperatures and just choose the best conditions. Thank you, Dave, for that very detailed answer. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, we run out of time, but please note that this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genangnews.com. If you miss parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to your colleagues and friends, which we highly recommend. Thanks again to the panel for the outstanding presentations, and thank you to our audience for your attention and for your very thoughtful questions. And thank you to Thermo Fisher Scientific, whose support made this webinar possible. Bye-bye for now.